All right, this will be video number two in a series I am creating to make a case for Colorado as the location, or I guess I should say former location, of Forrest Fenn's storied treasure. And uh, in my first video, I made a case for Warm Waters Halt and Too Far to Walk and went into all of the evidence that I had collected uh, for that. Uh, Warm, Waters, Warm Waters Halt being McNamee Peak, which is a triple divide uh, located northeast of Leadville, Colorado. And Too Far to Walk being Highway 24, which ultimately ends up in Toledo, Ohio. But leaving Leadville, it goes through the towns of Stringtown and Balltown. Um represented by the ball of string in Forrest's book. And as I discussed in my previous video that I plan to make more videos for the Home of Brown and the subsequent clues, and I still plan on doing that, but I made a, a little change of plans for today's video. Instead of going, in, going into the Home of Brown today, I want to discuss a chapter in Forrest's book, which I believe is an elaborate allegory representing the Collegiate Peaks, which just happens to be the mountains that you pass going south on Highway 24 from Leadville to Buena Vista. And I'm going to go through all of this, but I'm going to need to lay some groundwork and foundation in order for it to all make sense. And I promise if you bear with me, it'll all pay off in a real big way um, in the end when I show you what it all means. But in order to accomplish this, the first thing we need to do is go through this chapter and I'm going to highlight all of the spots in this chapter where he mentions a person or a book. And I'm going to show you how all those people and books ultimately come to represent the Collegiate Peaks. So without uh, further ado, let's just jump into the chapter and let's just find all of these references. So uh, he starts off the chapter um, and you'll see, it'll become obvious to you why I even thought to consider the Collegiate Peaks as a uh, potential hint uh, included in this chapter by the way he talks in this chapter. So he starts it off by saying, I still think about education sometimes, especially now that it's too late to get any. But with all of my days now in the fullness of time, it seems prudent to do a little investigating about higher things. Because I wasn't in college, I didn't get any I did I didn't get to read any of the great books that were written by really important authors, those guys like Hemingway and Fitzgerald, whom everyone looked up to. So oops. So the first people he mentions in the chapter are Hemingway and Fitzgerald, and he goes on to talk about For Whom the Bell Tolls and The Great Gatsby. And he kind of talks about reading those books and how he didn't really like them and so on. I mean, I'm assuming you've read this chapter before. And uh, he mentions um, that the girl at the front who is drinking the cup of coffee, which, by the way, that's going to come up again in my next video when I talk about the home of Brown. But not yet. But he talks about how this girl, how she graduated from a good school somewhere. Once again, a reference to college. Uh, so he says... Uh, Let's see, moving forward in the chapter, he talks about how the college professors always assign those books, but he didn't really understand that. And the next person he mentions is Robert Redford. He says, uh, if Robert Redford had ever written anything, he probably could have done it better than the guy who wrote that Gatsby book. So the next person he mentions is Robert Redford. Doesn't mention his book at all, but he does state that if he had ever written anything, so kind of implies um, a book that Robert Redford wrote that I will come back to. Um, and then he goes on to say, not having gone to college began to take on a whole new meaning for me now, and I was reinforced in the belief that I had hardly missed anything. Besides, some of the things I do pretty good I'm better at than some of those college guys are at what they do pretty good. So once again, a mention of college. Uh, in the next paragraph, he mentions J.D. Sollinger and how he had died that morning when he was at the bookstore. And then he talks about The Catcher in the Rye and how Forrest started to read that book and how it resonated with him in his own life and all of that stuff. Um, so then, a couple pages later, um, Forrest makes a brief reference to Napoleon. He says, Just because Napoleon said that history was nothing more than fables agreed upon, doesn't mean it's true. So we have a reference to Napoleon here. 
And then moving on to the next page, um, he talks about the book Kismet, how someone gifted it to him and he read that book and kind of liked it. But he doesn't mention anything about an author of Kismet, just mentions Kismet in general. And then going to the last paragraph of the chapter, he briefly mentions Einstein um, in his quote, um, imagination is more important than knowledge. And then he mentions Time Magazine at the end. He says, so when Catcher in the Rye was done, I threw it in the trash where it landed right on top of a Time Magazine. All right, and that's the end of all of the references to people and books, or in the last case, a magazine in the chapter. And... So, when I solved those first two clues, and I ended up on Highway 24, uh, driving right past the Collegiate Peaks, and reading this chapter and all the references he made to college, I started to come up with a hunch, just a hunch, nothing more than that, that maybe, just maybe, there was some way to bring this all into describing the Collegiate Peaks. And so I'm going to get out of this presentation here, and I'm going to show you a little drawing I came up with. So this is basically what you saw on the previous page. Um, it includes all of the authors mentioned, the books mentioned, um, and um, the, these two, I'll get to those. Um, he did not mention those in the chapter, but I'll get to why I put those there. And then I drew here the Collegiate Peaks, uh, Mount Princeton being south, the most southward, and Mount Oxford being the most northward. And you see Mount Harvard, Mount Columbia, Mount Yale, and all that. And then I have a couple blank mountains, and I'll get to those, too. All right, so um, my theory was maybe, I didn't know anything about these guys. I, don't, I didn't know where they went to college or anything, but my theory was that since Forrest talks so much about college and, you know, these college guys, maybe there was some connection between all the people mentioned and, and, and the schools named uh, that these mountains are named after. So I started getting to looking those up. So first I looked up, um, I, well, for, first of all, the reason I thought this connection might be possible is if you read, um, if you read in the, in the, in the chapter, he seems to make multiple references that could be interpreted as mountains. I'll go back to the first paragraph. He says, but with all my days now in the fullness of time, it seems prudent to do a little investigating about higher things. Maybe higher things are mountains. He, uh, spoke about... How um, the how Hemingway and Fitzgerald their books had big reputations and how everyone looked up to them. So a lot of references about uh, higher things uh, and things you look up to and all of that. And I looked up the Collegiate Peaks and well it turns out that uh, the Collegiate Peaks includes much of the Sawatch Range and has the highest average elevation of any of the wilderness area in the United States. So I think the Collegiate Peaks would certainly qualify as higher things. So I started looking up all of the people mentioned and in the chapter and to see where they went to college. Well, I was kind of disappointed right out of the gate to find out that Hemingway, he didn't go to college. So my theory was starting to seem a little bleak at this point, but I decided I would carry it out and, and, and look up the rest. So I looked up Fitzgerald. And... Turns out this one actually was a nice match because it turns out Fitzgerald went to Princeton University. So I went to my little map here and let's draw a line from uh, Fitzgerald to Mount Princeton. Let's carry on now. So the next person that came up was uh, Redford and I'll come back to Redford. Um, let's go to Sullinger now. So Sullinger, he brought him up. Um, it turns out Sullinger attended the, the Columbia University School of General Studies in Manhattan. That's another one that happens to be in the Collegiate Peak, so let's uh, mark that one down. So we have Sullinger, Mount Columbia. All right, well, he talked about Kismet in his, in his uh, chapter, but he did not mention the author. So I looked up Kismet, and uh, actually I'm going to go back here. So Kismet was originally written as a play by Edward Knobloch. So I looked up um, Edward Knobloch. So let's let's go into that. And uh, Edward Knobloch is right here. Let's see, where did he go to college? Oh, so he graduated from Harvard College in 1896. So we have another match. Let's draw a line from Knobloch. I put him here. So Knobloch to Harvard. Okay, but Kismet was also after 
After it was written as a um, play in 1953, a couple guys named Charles Lederer and Luther Davis adapted it into a musical. Well, Lederer, he didn't go to college, and if you want to look it up, you can. I'm not going to bother clicking into his page, but he didn't go to college. Luther Davis, however, did, and it turns out Luther Davis went to Yale. Boom, we have another match. So let's draw a line from Davis to Yale. So here we have four out of the five collegiate peaks knocked out, but we still have a lot of people to go through and a lot of holes to plug up here because the way I looked at this, if, the, if, if it didn't all fit together, none of it fits together. You can't just cherry pick. You got to account for every person and every book in here or it's nothing. All right, so moving on. Uh, we have Edward Knobloch, Luther Davis, and then I went on to Einstein. So it turns out Einstein made some visits to Oxford and he ultimately got, was awarded a honorary doctorate degree of science from them. So we have a guy with a degree from Oxford mentioned in the chapter, so we can draw another line, Einstein to Oxford. All right, so now we're gonna come back to Robert Redford. All right, so Robert Redford, where did he go to college? Well, conveniently, he didn't go to one of the, one of the collegiate peaks uh, schools, but he did go to the University of Colorado Boulder, which is where the Collegiate Peaks, or at least the state where the Collegiate Peaks are located. And that seemed like a nice fit. And that could I could have stopped there and that still would have, you know, it would have satisfied the demands of the allegory, so to speak. But I wasn't satisfied with that because it, I thought it was weird that Forrest said that um, Robert Redford, if he had ever written anything, it would be better than what Gadsby wrote. And yet Robert Redford did write something. He wrote this book, The Outlaw Trail, A Journey Through Time. All right, and I'm going to come back to this. I just wanted to get that out there. But I wanted to talk about Time Magazine as well. So let's come back to our drawing here. So this is, this is, this is all the collegiate peaks right here. But this is all part of a bigger mountain range called the Sawatch Range, as we saw in that Wikipedia article. So this is all part of the Sawatch. Now, is it cr too crazy? Is it too out there to suggest maybe Sawatch is a reference to time watch, as in your wristwatch? I don't think it's that out there. All of this is part of the Sawatch range. And that's why Forrest said, at the end of his chapter, he said, so when Catcher in the Rye was done, I threw it in the trash where it landed right on top of a Time magazine. Mount Columbia, represented um, by, it, it represents uh, Solinger in Catcher in the Rye, is in the Sawatch range. And that's why he threw it on top of a Time magazine. All right. So now we have accounted for time, we've accounted for Einstein, we've accounted for Kismet, we've accounted for Sollinger, uh, we've accounted for Redford, sort of, and we've accounted for, um, uh, but we have not accounted for Napoleon or Hemingway, um, and I'm going to show you something. So going back to the Outlaw Trail, A Journey Through Time. So you might not know about this, but there is a trail, there is a famous trail that goes through the Collegiate Peaks. In fact, it goes through all of Colorado. Maybe you know what trail I'm talking about. It's called the Colorado Trail. Now, let's use our imaginations a little bit here. So we have The Outlaw Trail, A Journey Through Time. That is the book that Robert Redford wrote, the one that Forrest failed to mention because he suggested that he had never written anything. And if you just substitute Robert Redford's alma mater for the word outlaw, you get The Colorado Trail, a journey through, and in this case, the Sawatch. And it fits precisely. The Colorado Trail goes right through the Sawatch range. That's a pretty big coincidence if it's not meant to be there. So, going back to our map, we're still missing a couple things, right? So, Napoleon. Well, Napoleon obviously didn't go to any of these schools. So, it's a bit of a problem. I mean, he mentioned him in the chapter, and if he wanted to make this a full allegory, that's a problem. And I thought that was the end of my uh, potential uh, hint I discovered. 
But then it turns out that in the collegiate peaks, right just west of Mount Princeton, there is a Napoleon Mountain right there. I mean, what are the odds, right? We're, we're missing the Napoleon piece of this puzzle, and they, we find it just a few miles away from Mount Princeton. I mean, come on. You can't make this stuff up. So let's go ahead and write that in. Here's Napoleon Mountain, and let's draw our line from Napoleon. So now all we're missing, all of this works, you know, Time Magazine works, Einstein, Kismet, Napoleon, Solinger, Redford is the Colorado Trail, and also, uh, there's another connection to Redford, but I'm not going to bother with that one right now. Basically, the connection is that there's a Mount Belford right here. That's uh, part of the Collegiate Peaks Wilderness. It's not, a, it's not a prestigious school. Actually, I'll just show you since I went through the time to pull it up. So Mount Belford was named, um, here's the, the story behind it. The reasoning behind Mount Belford's name is pretty unique, being that it's all about red hair. Colorado's first congressman, <coughs> so I got almonds in my throat. Colorado's first congressman, James Burns Belford, was known for vibrant personality, boisterous speeches, and bright red hair. Early miners in the area felt like this mountain resembled his persona, including the bright red dash of rock on top. So, if we're looking for another connection to Robert Redford, given that Mount Belford was named for this Belford guy with red hair, let's just cross out the first part of that and put red, and suddenly we have Robert Redford's name as the name of the mountain. I'm not saying that's necessarily what he intended, but it, it fits. So now all we're missing is a connection to Hemingway. How does Hemingway fit in up for, to all this? We don't have any mountains left to account for, but Hemingway is still the odd duck here, and this was troubling to me. Until one day, I drove to the town of Buena Vista, Colorado, and I'm going to show you. Welcome to Buena Vista, home of Matt Hemingway, silver medalist, 04 Olympics. Now, when there's one piece of your allegory missing, and they slapped it right on the Welcome to Buena Vista sign, uh, it starts to feel like there's, some, uh, there's something going on there. So I looked up this Matt Hemingway character, didn't know much about him. And it turns out, as it says here, he's related to the famous writer, Ernest Mother Effing Hemingway. The one missing piece of our allegory, Buena Vista. There you go. So here we have every single person mentioned in the chapter can be accounted for by the, by the geography of the Collegiate Peaks and every single, in the case where people weren't mentioned, the books and the people behind those books, or the magazine in this case, which encompasses all of it, it all fits. So you can take this or leave it. I think it's a pretty incredible, comprehensive, complete allegory um, that, that seems to work. Um, I was going to go into the home of Brown in this video, but I think I'll just leave it at that for today. And uh, next week, I'll release a video about the home of Brown, No Place for the Meek, uh, The End is Ever Dry 9, maybe No Paddle Up Your Creek as well. We'll see um, how much time I think it's going to take. And I'll, I'll either finish the solve in the next video or break it into two. So for, the, for now, I'll leave it at that. Thanks for listening.